Good morning, everybody. Hey, what a gift to be gathered together with the church this morning and hear your voices. Thank you for being with us. And especially if this is your first time at Faith Community Church, uh, we're honored to have you with us today. And we, we, are, uh, we just welcome you here. We're glad you're checking us out this morning. We're in a teaching series, as you saw in the video, called What is Faith? And for several months now, we've been listening closely to a letter in the New Testament called Hebrews, which is about the greatness and the uniqueness of Jesus. And in particular, it's about what really unfolded or what happened spiritually in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And now we've come to a point in the letter where the tone shifts and the author is beginning to ask the question for us, well, so what then? So if, if the blood of Jesus is a unique, once-for-all-time sacrifice for sin, and if it's true that he's open for us a new and living way to be in the presence of God, what does he want? What is faith? What does it do? And last week, if you were here, we read that faith draws near. Okay, I hope you've had a great week drawing near to the living God. I've been praying for you. I said last week it should blow our minds a little to think that all of the, everything up to this point, nine of the loftiest, densest theological chapters in the whole Bible have led to this point that God desires a relationship, a friendship with his people. Not just pity, not just benevolent mercy, but God wants to actually walk with his people. Faith draws near. Well, this week we pick up right where we left off and we're going to see today that faith perseveres. Okay? So, uh, we'll get right into our scripture reading this morning. We're still in Hebrews chapter 10. If you want to turn there with me, that'll be on page 1007 in a Bible under the chairs in front of you. Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm actually, some of this will sound familiar if you were here last week. I'm going to include last week's reading because it is all one continuous thought this morning. So, is everybody there? Hebrews 10? Chapter 9. Say, I'm there. All right. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. He writes this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week, we read in verse 22, Faith draws near, and this week you can see in verse 23 that faith holds fast. Another way to say it would be that faith perseveres. There are two more commands in the reading that we just did. Verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another. And verse 25, don't neglect meeting together. But those two other commands really are a means to verse 23, that we should hold fast. So this is a major reason why the letter to the Hebrews exists in the first place. The author wants you not to fall away from Jesus. 
The confession of our hope that he talks about in verse 23. The confession that we're holding fast to is all the doctrine that's come before in this letter about the greatness of Jesus over all other things and the uniqueness of the blood of Jesus as the only sacrifice by which we can draw near to God. Hold fast to that, he says, without wavering. Because he who promised is faithful. This is not a blind leap into the dark, everybody. If, if, if we rest our hope in the blood of Jesus to wash away our sin, is God not going to honor that, he's saying. So hold on. Now, the question today, why does he need to write that in the first place? And the answer is in verses 26 through 31. The reason is because there is a thing called Christian apostasy. Christian apostasy. This is when a, a, a kid raised in the church or someone that at one time professed faith in Jesus, someone who is aware of the doctrines of Jesus and has been part of the congregation at one time, falls away from him. It happens it's heartbreaking, and it's not a small thing. I want you to keep in mind, we're going to look at verses 26 to 31 right now, but I want you to please keep in mind that when we do, the purpose of Hebrews is not to shake or to shatter the faith of weak or struggling Christians. Is everyone clear on that? The purpose of Hebrews is not to shake or shatter the, the faith of weak or struggling Christians. If you're here today and you are wrestling with sin, you're young in your faith, you feel weak, you feel sometimes like you're just holding on to Christ by your fingernails, uh, Hebrews wants to say to you, draw near then. Draw, come on, draw near. This is here for you. The goal is not to shake or shatter you. It is, however, it is the purpose of Hebrews to stir up and provoke half-hearted Christians, distracted, bitter, false Christians. If you are careless about your soul, if you rarely give thought to what actually awaits you on the other side of death, if you are consoling yourself today with pop theology about the love of God, but you have not considered what he actually says, Hebrews is here to smack you awake. If you keep soothing a guilty conscience with, well, I'm not as bad as Hitler, you know, whatever, I haven't killed a million people. If there's no urgency in you to get your head around what, why did Jesus have to die? If there's no urgency in you to figure that out, Hebrews is here to say, please look again. Would you please consider again? I want you to notice, first of all then, in verses 26 through 31, these are addressed to Christians. Okay, verse 26, it says, uh, this is for people who have, quote, received the knowledge of the truth. That phrase is always used to describe people who've professed faith in Jesus. Verse 29, it's addressed to people who have, quote, profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. Sanctified is the author's, one of the, his favorite words to describe the church. People that God set aside for his special use. And then finally in verse 30, he's, it says, the Lord will judge his people. His people. This is not about people who've never heard of Jesus. This is for us. Okay, this is for the visible church. Those of you raised in church. Those of you who've heard of Jesus. It's for people who've been baptized participated in the worship and the ministries of the church, who shared communion with the church. There may even have been evidence of spiritual gifting. This is for people who've blessed the church with their, this is for pastors. Okay, this is for deacons and elders and ordinary members and people who've been a part of the church. Judas, of course, is the primary example 
of Christian apostasy. He shared in all the life of the disciples. He was sent out to preach the gospel just like the other apostles. People came to faith in Jesus because of Judas. When he cast out demons, they came out just the way they did everybody else. When Jesus said to the disciples, one of you is going to betray me, they genuinely had no idea who he was talking about. And yet Judas had already formulated his plan. He was an apostate, a part of the visible church, but fell away from Christ, and it happens all the time. Verse 26 says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. It's important that you understand what that phrase means. To, to go on sinning deliberately is not a reference to any and every sin. I had a pastor at one point in my life who taught that every time you sin, you lost your salvation. That is not so but so. It is way out of bounds, okay? That is not what this means. It is not talking about any and every sin. It's not even, brothers and sisters, it's not even talking about premeditated sin. I know what it's like. To make up my mind halfway through the day, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I need this. This just has to happen. It's not even talking about that. We read about, this is all in chapter 10, you know, two weeks ago. We talked about how salvation is a work of God's grace from beginning to end. It's the will of the Father that saves us. It's the blood of the Son that makes it possible. The Spirit of God guarantees a transformation from the inside out. We're not going to rehash all that. This is not talking about just ordinary day-to-day -day struggle with sin, even premeditated sin. It's talking about who, those who go on, who just continue in a pattern of unrepentant, I don't care, I'm going to do what I want living. That's the fruit of a life, of a heart that has actually turned away from Christ. So this is, this is the, the sin. Okay, it's, it's a renunciation of Jesus. Verse 28 gives it another word. Verse 28 says, you know, those who set aside the law of Moses died without mercy. Setting, setting aside Christ or sinning deliberately, those are synonyms, the same things. We're talking about someone that just no longer is trusting in the blood of Jesus. They've turned to some other way, they've turned to some other religion or philosophy, that's Christian apostasy. You will, you will wrestle. I just need you to hear this, especially if you're a young Christian. You're going to wrestle with indwelling sin and sinful thoughts and sinful desires until you die or Christ returns. Welcome to the Christian life, okay? Remember, apostasy is when the wrestling stops. It's when repentance stops and you just say, I'm just going to do what I want. You remember last week, this will be on the screen, last week we said faith is a decision to respond to what God has said. Okay, apostasy is anti-faith. Apostasy is a decision that I will not respond to what God has said. It's that simple, okay? Jesus calls this the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've read this before. This is from Mark chapter 3, verse 28. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. This is the one that cannot be forgiven. This is why people go to hell. Because they hear the word of God, which is the voice of the Holy Spirit, and they say, I'm not going to respond to that. I don't want that. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, Stephen calls it resisting the Holy Spirit. He says, you, you stiff-necked people, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And that's why the book of Hebrews pleads in chapter 4, today, and I'm pleading with you now, today if you hear his voice, Please, for God's sake, do not harden your heart. If we will not trust the blood of Jesus, 
verse 26 and 27 say, there is no sacrifice left for you. Only a fearful expectation of judgment and fury. What else is God supposed to do? If we turn away from the blood of the Son of God poured out for you in love, freely given to you in love, if you turn away from that, what is he supposed to do? Who else is he supposed to send from heaven to address the issue? Verse 28. You remember all, you know, for months now, we've been saying that one of the themes of Hebrews is that everything that unfolded under the law of Moses was just a shadow. It's a shadow of something coming that's real. And for the most part over the last few months, we've, that principle's been applied to the worship of Israel. So the priests and the sacrifices, the tabernacle, these were a shadow of the sacrifice of Jesus that was coming. But now we see in verse 28, the foreshadowing doesn't stop there. All of those scenes of judgment that we read about in the Old Testament... Those were just a shadow too. That's, that's, that story about the earth opening up to swallow Achan, the story about the fire coming out from the altar to burn the sons of Aaron to death, the story of the purging of the promised land, the plagues of Egypt, those are just a shadow too. Verse 28 says, anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and outraged the Spirit of grace? It is a fearful thing, he says, to fall into the hands of the living God. So faith perseveres. It holds fast to the confession of our hope in Jesus, and yet people fall away all the time. All the time. So verses 24 and 25 provide for us a response. Here is one of the means that God has given to the church to keep us in the love of God, and it's super sexy. Go to church. Okay? He says, uh, Christians fall away, pastors fall away, people you would never think could do that really do fall away. And so there should be a sense of end of the day's urgency to Christian fellowship and to the Christian gathering. And to do that, we need to keep showing up. I'll just use, I, I've been thinking all week, you know, there, there's like a million reasons people fall away from the love of God. Uh, to, keep, to keep this, you know, <laughs> to a reasonable time, I'll just share one teaching from Jesus about why people fall away. In his teaching, Jesus uh, told the story of a farmer who went out to sow seeds. And some of those seeds fell on good ground and they produced this incredible crop, these incredibly fruitful lives. And then some of it, uh, a lot of it, didn't bear any fruit at all. And Jesus explains why. Okay, so he says, for example, some of the seeds fell on a path and Satan swooped down and snatched up the seed before it ever really had a chance. And these are people, Jesus explains, these are people who for a variety of reasons just don't really have a lot of interest in spiritual things. Uh, they're content with their lives. They're content with the world. They're distracted, and they can't see beyond the next few years, let alone, you know, the idea of eternity. And so the word of God just kind of skips off their hearts. It never really even has a chance. Now, we've talked about this in this series already, but it bears repeating that here in Hudson and the St. Croix Valley, we have it within our power to distract ourselves every weekend if we choose to. We have the means at our disposal to distract our kids and ourselves from ever needing to think about the state of our souls and from ever needing to consider that heaven and hell might be realities. Everything, everything in our entertainment and everything in our education reinforces this idea. Shh, 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 shh. 
There's nothing out there. There's nothing to worry about. Here's a little, here's a little Netflix. Here, suck on that. Just go to sleep, little fella. There's nothing to see here. And yet Hebrews comes along and says that that reality is right there. The day is near. The day is almost here. Everyone reading this book in the first century understood that the resurrection of Jesus is the signal. The end of the ages has come upon us and history is racing toward its goal as we speak this morning. The gospel is reaching into almost every nation on the planet and we are living in the final act and the, and, and the church in the United States is sleeping. Mm. Mm. So let us consider, he says, how to stir up one another to love and good works. That word stir up is almost, it's usually used negatively in the Bible and it means to poke someone, okay? It means to provoke them. It's not like the funnest word. To poke, to, to provoke. And this is a part of why we meet. Because you will get sleepy. We say to one another in our missional communities, our small groups, our fellowships, hey, you look sleepy. You are living like this is all that there is. That Jesus is not just about to return. You are looking lazy and half-hearted. Poke! Let's wake up. Part of why we preach the way that we do is because I know you're going home to Netflix today. Shh, that preacher's crazy. He's insane. Here's a little Amazon Prime, just... So go to church and stay awake, for goodness sake. The other seeds, Jesus says, other seed fell on what he calls rocky soil. And it did take root, and it sprang up really quickly, but then the sun rose, and the heat increased, and there, it, there wasn't enough root there, and it, it withered and it died. These are people, Jesus explains, who hear the word of God and they respond initially with joy, but trouble and persecution, that's, those are his words, trouble and persecution come and their faith withers. And I'm just, I have to tell you, to be a mature Christian requires that sooner or later you experience disappointment with God and you figure out it's not fatal. Sooner, on the other side of disappointment with God is a deeper and greater maturity because you come to God with all kinds of misconceptions, just like you came to marriage with all kinds of misconceptions. And just on the other side of your disappointment in each other is the marriage you've always longed for. So it is with Christ. So two months into your relationship with God, there are still issues you're still wrestling with things that you thought you'd work through. The, you know, the thrill has worn out. You're not changing as fast as you'd hope. Your family and friends are not as excited about your newfound spiritual joy as you would hope, and it creates doubt. I'd say also Christian maturity requires sooner or later we experience disappointment with the church and figure out it's not fatal either. Every single mature Christian that I have ever met has had to weather serious disappointment with church. Can, a few, can five of you say, yep, yep. yeah. And sometimes that disappointment can go on for a long time. But it's when bitterness sets in, bitterness toward God, bitterness toward the church, and church attendance becomes sporadic, and we lose our grip on the beauty of Jesus. And one day, we're just another one of those people for whom Christianity just hasn't worked. And we fall away. So verse 24 says, let us consider how to stir up one another. Consider, it's just a reminder that Christian fellowship should have an element of intentionality and, and purpose. Helping each other hold fast to Christ requires some thought, some planning. I just, I love it when we accidentally manage to do it right. Praise God that we can accidentally get it right. But for the most part, 
there needs to be some thought and intentionality. So uh, the other thing, uh, an elder pointed this out to me this week, this word consider, the Greek word has the sense of kind of let's get down in there. Let's get down into the situation and see what's really going on. And so it's not just that we need to be intentional, but you need to be in a position to get in there with each other. And that's my challenge to you this morning. Are you in a position where other members of the church, other people within the church, are in there with you and you're in there with them so that you can stir each other up? I can... You know, Porter and I can stir you up from the pulpit, but I am not going home with you, okay? I have my own family. That's my first responsibility. I have a missional community, you know, that we have kind of covenanted to be with. We have friends here at church. So please find that with us. And if you're struggling to find it, would you help us build it? And if you're struggling to build it with us, would you pray with us? We have a long way to go in these, in these areas. We, we long so much to be a Christ-centered community that knows and sees each other and actually can care for each other. So join us in, pr- in praying and, in, uh, and doing that. Trouble and persecution are part of the Christian life. With the church, it becomes an enormous opportunity to grow. Without it, you may fall away. And third, Jesus says... There's other seed that fell among thorns. And it tried to come up. It it did put down some roots and it tries to come up. But quote, he says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things came in and choked out the the word. Okay, so trouble can be dangerous for your soul. Success can be really dangerous too. Success and comfort, riches can be really dangerous. This is a lot like the seed scattered on the path, you know, that just kind of skipped off the surface. But what's different is that for a time in this person's life, the word manages to create something. It gets down in there. It begins to grow. But then what happens is whatever the initial thing was that drove that person to seek God, it gets taken care of. And... They're all good. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, so my presenting issue is gone. And I just, I don't need God anymore. I don't need the church anymore. And suddenly they, they disappear. So the, the marriage heals or the, the, you know, the business gets back on its feet. The addiction is dealt with. And we don't see them anymore. Success can be as dangerous for your soul as trauma. So uh, verse 24 says we're here to consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds. So I, I just want to say that church is more than a group therapy session together. Okay? We're not just here to help resolve one another's life issues. We want to be a Christ-centered community that really does bring healing and help to the St. Croix Valley. We are pouring an enormous amount of energy and resources into our biblical counseling ministry and into seeing lives and marriages being transformed. But God is actually, in saying yes to Jesus, you are being brought into something that is massively bigger than your life. God's purpose in saving and redeeming and giving life is to display his glory and majesty and power in the worship and unity and love of the church. So Ed Ed Clowney uh, writes this, he says, to be sure, if the church, rather than Christ, becomes the center of our devotion, then spiritual decay has begun. A doctrine of the church that does not center on Christ is self-defeating and false, but... Jesus said to his disciples, I will build my church. To ignore his purpose is to deny his lordship. The good news of Christ's coming includes the good news of what he came to do, to join us to himself and to one another as his body, the new people of God. Christian witness 
that is limited to private religious experience cannot challenge the world. We are not just individual points of light, but a city set on a hill in the midst of hostility that ravages the world. The church must show the bond of Christ's love that unites former enemies as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Only then can the church be a sign of his kingdom, the kingdom that will come when Christ returns and that is already here through the Spirit. So that to belong to Christ by faith is not just to experience his power personally. It is to be joined to a living body called the church. Ephesians 2.10 says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. God has made you and then gifted you with unique gifting and then grafted you into his family, into his body for the display of his glory. So don't neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. When the church gathers here at Faith Community Church, down the street at Trinity Lutheran, across town at Christ Center Assembly, when the church gathers, something that was invisible suddenly emerges as visible and then scatters again and is joined together again, week in and week out. And there should be an end of the world sense of purpose to what we're doing together. So faith holds fast to Jesus. How do we do that? We join ourselves in a meaningful way to a church. A couple of things before we go to communion. It is August 13th, and that means that this week and next week, a bunch of you are going off to college, or off to boot camp, or off to trade school. You're leaving mom and dad in the dust. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I want to invite you to consider something that will set the trajectory for your life that you may have never thought about, and that is this. Next Sunday morning, at eight o'clock in the morning, when it's completely dead in your dormitory and not a creature is stirring, I want you to get up and go to church. I want you to get up. If, if you want to stick out like a sore thumb at your university, it's really simple. <laughs> get up and go to church. I'm an inv I want to, let me preface this by saying, university students, I love you. Darcy and I keep a list of you that we pray for. I love you. I don't want you to watch us online. I want you to get up and I want you to emerge. Every, every community big enough for a university will have churches worth your time. And I want you to go and I want you to see it. I want you to see what the church, it's, the church is an enormous thing, enormous. I want you to go and be with them. I want you to lend your voice to their worship. I want them to be able to see you. You have no idea what a gift you are. Go to church. Second thing, as long as, you know, we just announced this uh, fall kickoff coming up. So it feels a little funny to talk about this in the middle of August because you could lay down probably and take a nap right now in here. I don't know if you would remember though before the summer, it was getting real tight in here. Does anyone remember that? And we would joke about sitting on each other's laps and all that. <laughs> okay. Well, we've actually had a lot of new people come during the summer too. And it's my hope and expectation that come fall kickoff time, it is going to be tight in here. Real tight. Shoulder to shoulder, <laughs> lap to lap. You know, I, don't, I don't know what it's going to take. And part of my concern is that uh, it, it will just be really easy for you to say, ah, oh, it's pajama Sunday, and we're all going to stay home. I just, this, this here, okay? I, I really love that we can do online streaming of our services, and here's who it's for. Uh, first of all, we have people in our body, people we love, members of our body, who are sick and cannot be here. They should not be here. It's not safe. 
And I love that they can join us in that way. Secondly, we have a lot of people who are just checking things out and this is the new way to, this is the new front door. We, I mean, like a third of you at this point probably spent a month watching online before you're like, okay, I'll show up and see if those people are the real deal, okay? Praise God, we can do that. Uh, third, it, there's, a, there's a great opportunity for evangelism and streaming online. And then, you know, my parents watch online, so that's a fourth reason. We gotta, we gotta let them, okay? But, but for those who are healthy, for those who can, for those who live in the community, you're called to join yourself to a living, live body in whatever way that you can. And I know it's going to get tight. I don't know if you've been paying any attention to that. We publish all the elders meeting notes online. I don't know, you know, the five of you that maybe go out and read those or whatever, but we are working on it. We have a plan in place to create more space in here, but we're not going to start swinging hammers for, a long, for several months. I'm asking you to come, make space for each other, shoulder to shoulder, cheek to cheek, whatever it takes, and be with the church. Because you bring, there's something supernatural, we'll get into this in chapter 12, there is something supernatural that emerges when the church gathers in Jesus' name. All right. There are two things that Jesus has given to the church to create the borders of the kingdom. One of those is baptism. Baptism is your uh, citizenship initiation. So anyone here that is following Jesus, if you've not been baptized, you need to take care of that in two weeks. Okay, that's your, those are your entry papers into the kingdom. Communion is how we say to one another and we say to the Lord Jesus, I'm still holding fast to you. I'm still here. I'm still one with the body and I'm holding fast. And I thank you for the blood of Jesus that keeps me here. So as we go to communion today, I want to give you a moment right now to just say that. If that's true, God, I'm still here. I'm holding fast. I'm asking for grace to continue holding fast. I'm going to give you a moment. I, every one of us has people that we know who've fallen away. I want you to pray for them right now. And then we'll share in the supper together. Our Father in heaven, as we come to communion today, my heart is heavy, our hearts are heavy. I can think of a dozen friends that have fallen away. I know there are people even here under the sound of my voice this morning. This is their first time in church in a long time. God, if you are so gracious to show mercy to people like us. Would you do that for them? Would you awaken kids, grandkids, friends? Would you awaken them again to the beauty of what you have done in your son Jesus? Thank you for his blood by which we draw near with confidence and full assurance of faith. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. Thank God. Let's stand and sing with gusto together.